Hope y'all having a good ass day, <laughs> cause I am. Today's video, let me start by saying it's been a long time coming. <sighs> this is what the people been want. This is what the people been wanting. They said, "What people? I've been real delicate how I handle this legend that we're gonna focus on today. The late, the great, Marsha P. Johnson, Miss Marsha P. Johnson." Um, what was it? Maybe, I think it's been at least a year ago. I watched um, this documentary on Netflix where one of her friends, who is also an activist, um, the focus was on her and how they were trying to figure out what happened to Marsha P. Johnson because it get, the story gets swept under the rug and we can even so much compare to how Marsha P went out kind of the same way, not exactly, of course, but how Next passed away, in a sense. If you watch that documentary, you'll see where I'm coming. We're not going to focus so much on that documentary. This is specifically about Marsha P and what she's done for not just the queer community, but the Black community, the, the world, how we view the world. It takes that one person to stand up and lead us to the right way. So we're going to start off, not going to talk too much, just let's dive in. Marsha P. Johnson, give her some light. This won't be the only video on Marsha P. Johnson, but because it's Women's Month, we cannot forget about our trans women, our trans sisters, who help pave the way just like anybody else, just like anybody else. People love to, and and when I say people, let's be specific about it. The general public, the society we live in, your friends, your community of people you engage with online, whoever that may be, who you're with out and about. Marsha P. Johnson was one of the most prominent figures of the gay rights movement of the 1960s and 1970s in New York City always sporting a smile. Johnson was an important advocate for homeless LGBTQ plus youth, those affected by HIV and AIDS and gay and transgender rights. Marsha P. Johnson was born on August 24, 1945 in, El in Elizabeth, New Jersey. Assigned male at birth, Johnson grew up in an African-American working class family. Johnson's father worked on the General Motors assembly line in Linden, New Jersey, and her mother was a housekeeper. Johnson grew up in a religious family and began attending Mount Teeman African Methodist. She remained a practicing Christian for the rest of her life. Johnson enjoyed wearing clothes made for women and wore dresses starting at age five. Even though these clothes reflected her sense of self, she felt pressured to stop due to the other children's bullying and experiencing a sexual assault at the hands of a 13-year-old boy. Immediately after graduating from Thomas A. Edison High School, Johnson moved to New York City with one bag of clothes and $15. Once in New York, Johnson returned to dressing in clothing made for women and adopted the full name Marsha P. Johnson. The P stood for Pay It No Mind, a phrase that became her motto. Johnson described herself as a gay person, a transvestite, and a drag queen, and used she, her pronouns. The term transgender only became commonly used after her death. It was not easy to live on the margins. New York State still persecuted gay people and frequently criminalized their activities and presence. Rights for the LGBTQ plus people were limited and sometimes ignored completely. Having difficulty finding employment, Johnson turned to sex work. She was often abused by clients and arrested by the police. She also did not have a permanent home during this time and bounced around sleeping at friends' homes, hotels, restaurants, and movie theaters. She also found work waiting tables and performing in drag shows. In a 1992 interview, Johnson said, 
I was no one, nobody, from Nowheresville until I became a drag queen. Not long after moving to New York, then 17-year-old Johnson met 11-year-old Sylvia Rivera. Rivera, a Puerto Rican transgender girl, and the two became instant friends. Rivera later said of Johnson, she was like a mother to me, as Johnson had done for herself. She encouraged Rivera to love herself and her identity. Johnson adored wearing colorful, fun outfits that she made from finds at thrift stores and discarded items. She also, she was also often seen wearing a crown of flowers, which is, you know, that photo she's famously known for smiling with the flowers showering above her head. Um, Johnson's life changed when she found herself engaging with the resistance at the Stonewall Inn on June 28, 1969. In the early morning hours, police raided the bar and began arresting the patrons, most of whom were gay men. Johnson and Rivera arrived at Stonewall around 2 a.m., where Johnson said in a late interview, the place was already on fire and there was a raid on it. The riots had already started. There are many competing stories about what Johnson did during the raid on the Stonewall Inn, but it's clear, but it is clear she was on the front lines. Johnson, like many other transgender women, felt they had nothing to lose. They were not only angered by the police raid, but also the oppression and fear they experienced every day. The first gay pride parade took place in 1970 in a series of gay rights groups. Johnson was involved in the early days of both, but grew frustrated by the exclusion of transgender and LGBT. Let's speak on that a little bit. Just, just a tad, just a tad. There, there's always going to be an issue within a community. The queer community also have their issues. One of them being, it's segregated as fuck. <laughs> it's segregate, segregated in a lot of ways. One being POCs, people of color in the queer community. It will be the first in NYC to honor transgender women. In 2020, New York State named a waterfront park in Brooklyn for Johnson. Johnson is also now the subject of many documentaries. She remains one of the most recognized and admired LGBTQ plus advocates. But I like to say the queer community as a whole because every every letter that people want to make fun of has their own struggle, you know. And I can only speak to so many. That's why we're learning together because I can only tell you so much. I can only tell you my experience. I can't tell you someone else and I can't tell you someone who's bisexual how they feel and what they experience. I can't tell you that. See, she here's another photo of it. I haven't seen too many photos, Marsha, because I feel like it's the same one and they repeat it over and over and over. So I like to see more photos of her. Um, this was in 1988. I definitely wasn't born then yet, but I was coming up. I'm coming up. We're going to, we're going to, I'm going to rewatch the doc and we're going to go over that because that's important. Okay, so this is from National Park Service. Okay, let's go. Okay, here's another photo of her. I always see the people with the cig in your hand. I know that's her. I always be now and then young people that don't have no money, want to sit by and help them, you know? So I help them out with like a place to stay or little tea or a little tank to the apartment. And they don't never forget it. A lot of times I've reached my hand out to younger people in the gay community that just didn't have nobody to help them out. They were down and down. She would take her last two dollars. Willie once said to me, we only had two dollars and we bought a box of cookies. And you know, by the time we walked down to the river, Marge had given away all the cookies that we had spent our last two dollars on. The reason for that is because Marsha had been hungry, had lived on the streets, and she knew that a chocolate chip cookie to a starving queen was a great gift. Why are you here today? Darling, I want my gay rights now. I think it's about time the gay brothers and sisters got gay rights, and especially the women. How will this affect you your job? Darling, I don't need a job. I'm on welfare. I have no choice because the job is only this country discriminated against homosexuals. Yes, I mean, homosexuals, bisexuals, and 
tried sexual knowledge. And he has no straight people. Uh-huh. Because yeah. it is trying out women, honey. Thank you very much for talking to us. Why are you here today? I'm here because of a dyke. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I hope they, you know, come to their senses and, and pass a normal bill. <laughs> that's, that's what. 18 years old when I met him, and he mentioned Marsha, that he went to the village and hung out with Marsha, and I said, I don't think Marsha's the kind you should want to hang out with. Marsha, who I saw in the flower, just getting crowned holy by people from India. She knows something that I don't know. I met Marsha on Christopher Street, and the first time I saw her, I said, is it this person? I remember seeing Marsha walk down the street in a mini skirt that he had made with nothing on underneath. And it was clearly see-through. And she'd be coming up Christopher Street with the roll-down stockings, fuzzy slippers, her wig and beer can rollers. Hello, everybody. What a wonderful morning. Over the top with the jewelry, flowers in her hair, very creative-looking, very commanding of attention, not wanting to get it, but just getting it anyway. I always remember knowing Marsha P. Johnson. I must have known her before I was 9 or 10. Maybe younger. She would hang out with my father a lot in the kitchen. I remember them spending a lot of time talking in the kitchen. And when my father would leave, if he would leave to go do an errand or if he would leave to do something, she would stay with me. So in some ways, I guess you could say Marsha P. was the babysitter of mine. Uh, March is like a bodhisattva. Her presence on Sheridan Square or on Christopher Street or wherever she stopped and asked for spirit change or chatted with people. It was a religious, holy experience. And all of us who did drag or partial drag always admired her and thought of her as a, a patron saint. She had this kind of glow about her. She's like an angel. Our spirit shined. My father thought that her heart was in the right place, that she was someone to be trusted. I mean, she, she'd always take five bucks, but she would always say, and, and I'm going to give you back 20, Tony. And she meant it. She meant it because she had a generous heart, a generous spirit, but also because she was convinced she was going to get this billionaire boyfriend, and she was going to be living great with him. Marsha was one of those colorful New York characters that you would see bouncing around the piers or the village in plastic and lame and glittery things and hoop earrings. And I always wondered who was that, and she always said hello. And I did a little research at the time, and it turned out she wasn't just a kook, she was a serious activist and entertainer. She floored every audience. They just adored her. And I kept wondering, what the hell is it? When I think of Marsha P. Johnson, I think of someone who kids today who are gay know nothing about, which is a shame, really, because she's one of the reasons they are sitting in all their liberated glory today, but uh, Marsha paid the price for who she was. I was young, but I was young and naive when I started wearing just at five years old. I stopped for a long time. The boy next door used to try and get fresh with me, you know, try and have sex. I don't think you should have sex until after you marry. I found out that boys do have sex when I was raped by this boy. Who was about, uh, he was about 30 years old, and he had my legs, uh, you know, got all this sticky stuff all over my legs. And I, I somewhat knew that boys had sex with boys, because the boy next door, and he used to jerk off together, you know. I mean, just that, that, uh, a little child's thing when I was about 12 years old, you know. But I didn't think he'd have to stick it in, I wanted to stop there. I didn't think people had sex, period. I was still like that. I think, oh, he wouldn't do that. Oh, no, he wouldn't lift that man's toes. Oh, no. See, he would eat that, that girl would eat that girl out. That guy would eat that girl out. I don't you know, I think like that, but I know that they would when I go to the movie. I don't believe you 
you should have sex until after you marry. Or at least that's the way I would, you know, think it should be. I got married to Jesus Christ in church when I was 16 years old, still in high school, and I haven't married anybody in church since then. Because I think he's the only man I can really trust. It's like the spirit that follows me around, you know, and helps me out my hours and needs. And this is so all my problem, and never laughed at me. <laughs> it takes me very serious. I started coming to New York and meeting senior queens. And I didn't meet drag queens, as you would say, drag queens, until I can, uh, early 60s. So the world was so different then, was gay people were scheduled for non-existence. In other words, we were supposed to have no reality called gay, homosexual, except to be in a mental institution getting shock treatments or getting fired from a job. I knew her from the mid-60s and through the 70s, and Marsha always gave this blessed presence and encouragement to be who you wanted to be. Those who were a little too feminine were frowned upon, but Marsha and a few others would stand ramrods straight, shoulders back, head high, and present themselves, and that encouraged so many people, or gave happiness to people and said, I wish I had the guts to do that. She would sort of hold court in Sheridan Square and saying, we're in the village, we're free, live. Queens is used to just wear a little bit of makeup and go out to the street boys club and turn day. There was no place as a, a safe haven for a gay kid. The only place, option you have was a bar or to pick up a job to find a place to stay for the night if you were a young you know, street kid and it was cold out. Or that was it. You really didn't have many options. When I first met Marsha in the early 70s, Marsha was homeless. I know some of the girls would live in various places for short periods of time. They would get a, a hotel room or all the baths she used to stay a lot. And there was a place in Brooklyn, a house in Brooklyn where the girls lived for a while. But none of those things lasted very long. Sometimes I really wondered how she got through it. And then I know she used to sleep in the movies too on 42nd Street. It was 99 cents before noon. So she'd get up there before noon and she would sleep up there if she needed a place to sleep. It was amazing. It really was amazing how he was able to survive and get through through life without having a place to really call home. Marsha had a following around town of like, People that, I mean, I, I go to the flower district and, and they have these big tables where they sort like lilies and things. Marsha would be sleeping under them. And I saw this more than once. And I would say to the guy there, why is she here? And, and the guy would just say, oh, she's holy. And, and, and there were all these people that like had whatever was going on in their head. Marsha became this, this, and then they would, she would stay there and they would give her Marsha, the leftover flowers, tons and tons of daffodils. Maybe she'd take her last $10 and go out the door and come back 20 minutes later with this big bouquet, $10 worth of flowers. And I'd say, Marsha, what are you doing wasting your last $10 on flowers? And she'd go in my back room and be putting them in her hair and making this incredible arrangement. She'd say, oh, don't worry, Mr. Wicker. She said, these flowers are going to make me a lot of money. And they would. She went around decked in flowers a lot, remember? That's what she gets those to throw in. Well, she always hit flowers. Yeah. She yeah, put right. Christmas lights in on the Christmas lights. Later. Roy was a young hooker, 18 years old when I met him. i make a long story short, he ended up staying here. I sort of took him in. He essentially became my adopted son. And one night, he said to me, it was very cold out, about 10 degrees. He said, could Marsha come and sleep here? Because, you know, she didn't mind sleeping on the floor. Marsha likes to sleep on the floor. Which I thought, now, Willie, you never lie. Why did you tell me a fib like that? And so I allowed Marsha to come in that night, and she was here for the next 12 years. I always just do drag. I never do it seriously. Because I don't have the money to do serious drag. Years ago, I used to have to get some of my stuff and then out of the trash can and bring it home and wash it. I've never been an extravagant type drag queen that can go out to a fancy store in town and buy expensive dresses. I've always had to get my dresses donated or I have to get them at a strip shop or something like that because those are the only ones that really got real nice stuff at cheap prices. And her taking us to a Salvation Army and other thrift shops was an art form. 
because she knew for five dollars, maybe three dollars, you should be able to get yourself an outfit. And that's of course to get a friend, you know, have no dress and pop to donate it to you. And that's not too often. But once they see you and see how good you look a lot of go home and get on your dress and try and come out looking twice as good. Marsha had a long purple lilac gown that she favored. And by the time she finished fixing it, but a cut here and, and scissors here and a razor blade here for the bottom and gussied it up with glitter. And she favored that. I mean, I know that that dress really got her working out. She wore that one for a long time. Marsha lived with me here in Hoboken. Now, this is a high rise building. Our apartment always notorious as being the gay apartment because of the strange people that came and went. So I told Marsha, no problem living here, but you can't come and go from this building in drag because I was afraid that would be pushing things too far. So she would wear bulky clothing and get on the path train and then the dress would drop out from underneath the leather jacket. And by the time she hit Christopher Street, she would have transformed herself into a drag queen, except for these huge, clunky male shoes that were about size 12 or something. She wasn't the kind of queen who questioned her drag, because she had very little. And, you know, she wasn't well-dressed, coordinated kind of drag queen. She put on what was available and what, you know, fulfilled her idea of being a woman to some extent. It was a very, very natural look, and all her own. It was amazing to me that all these people held Marsh, and these were people from, like, all over the world, that, that like, I don't know what the concept was going on there. She would go out and stand on the corner and... People knew her, and they'd take pictures with her. Or she'd say, could you spare some change for a starving actress? One of the great things about Marsha's friendliness is that there was no agenda to it. I had the feeling that she probably had no idea who I was, just like I didn't know who she was. But she always said hello. She always broke that wall and was friendly the way most New Yorkers aren't. Not because she wanted an item. She was just, on the surface, a really happy-go-lucky person. Could you give me a dollar? Do you have a dollar for a dying drag queen or a starving queen. It was sort of a Robin Hood. She would ask for money from people who were in the street going by and say, for instance, they would give her some money. Uh, two minutes later, she'd turn around and give it to somebody else who needed it. She'd say, here, honey, get yourself something to eat. She would not argue or fight the people who insulted her. Why don't you get off Christopher Street? You're giving us a bad name. She was like the mayor of Christopher Street. And the queens definitely crossed the street or went around the block with their johns. It wouldn't be called Deborah because they were too highfalutin. They had the look, but not the spirit. Marsha had the spirit. She just didn't nod or acknowledge you. She turned around and said hello. She was always like that, which gave you a chance, even fleetingly, to know her. Uh, she was warm. So everybody knew Marsha. No one had anything bad to say about Marsha. Marsha was really well liked. Ours in establishment 86er, and she said, if they don't want me in their establishment even to buy a soda or something, I'll go somewhere else. I don't look for trouble. Homophobia in the gay community, you know, she used to say that some of the queens treated their dogs better than they treated her. They would go by and say, what is it? She would say right to them, you know, what do you care what it is? You're not giving it anything. I didn't get into it right away. I was like a butch makeup queen. And then I started doing little different drags. And I started wearing little high heel shoes, you know. And I started putting on dark And I started becoming a drag queen. I was one of the Stonewall girls. One of the first girls to ever come in drag to Stonewall. 1969, when the Stonewall riot started, that's when I started my little riot. When Jerry Hoos, who was the founder of the Gay Liberation Front, arrived at the Stonewall Inn that night, uh, he was met by his friend John Goodman. And John Goodman told him that the soon after Jackie Harmona started fighting the police, that both Marsha Johnson and Zazu Nova joined in. I've been gay liberation ever since the first time in 1969. I was in the Stonewall riot. After the riots, Morty Manford, and Marty Robinson, both very important figures in the Gay Activist Alliance, both told Robin Souza that Marsha Johnson was involved in starting the riots. The story that Robin Souza then told me was that Marsha Johnson said, I got my civil rights, and then threw a shot glass into a mirror, and that started the riots. 
uh, in GAA, this became known as the shot glass that was heard around the world. In this case, the mythology reflects the facts, and I think that when we weigh all the evidence together, we have to conclude it's extremely likely that she was among the first to physically resist the police. A spark comes along and it's like near gasoline and it goes kabang, and that's what happened that night. And so don't ever think that if there were no stone wall, that, that it would just be like it is now, because it was a horrible world before that. We were all runaways, and some of them were like 14 years old. Some people had scalding water thrown on them by their parents. People that couldn't go back home no matter what. Couldn't go back to school no matter what. And, and that group of people was the catalyst in the riot. It was the street kids who had nothing to lose that were the force that got it going. History isn't something that you look back at and say, oh, that's inevitable. That would have happened anyway. No, it happens because people make decisions that are sometimes very impulsive and of the moment, but those moments are cumulative realities. Why are you here today? Darling, I want my gay rights now. That's when I started my little writing. I want to get into this fabulous little dress. And it's fabulous little hair to hair. And, and learning how to do makeup and come out. Because I found out that my body was worth the money in those days. I found out if you're a pretty boy or a pretty little transvestite, you can make a couple little dollars, and that's why I learned how to hustle. And then I, I found out the prettier you look as a little boy, or the prettier you look as a little boy made up as a girl, that's the most money you're going to make. And the best way to do it is with your own natural hair. Wigs and stuff like that were in the 60s, but the ones that used to make the most money was the boys that look like girls with all hair, with just a little bit of makeup, and have a little hormone tip, because that's when the girls' hormones start coming out in the 60s, just before the dumb more right. And people were just starting to really get into it. And I used to be down, before it was as fancy as it is now, we all hung out because we went sunbathing. And I would be sitting there, and suddenly Marsha would come along and grab my shirt. Mm -hmm. and say, she always called me by my two names, Bob Cole. Never called me Bob, ever. And she said, Bob Kohler, give me, and she took out and I said, Marsha, would you stop? And suddenly Marsha would be naked, stark naked in broad daylight down at the pier. And I say, Marsha, so she said, my father needs his clothes. And I would be hanging onto my clothes for dear life. And Marsha would be trying to get them off. And she would usually get just like a shirt at the most. And she'd throw it in. And these were sacrifices to her father and to Neptune, who got all mixed up together. Marsha only very rarely talked about her father. She did tell me once when she she had looked into the river and seen her father at the bottom of the river. She was making offerings of flowers and change to King Neptune as an appeasement to help her friends who are on the other side. Then she would, after she settled all of that and sort of snarled at me for not giving all my clothing, she would go up Christopher Street where she would be picked up about midway. I mean, somebody would see Marsha, you know, naked queen walking up the street, and they would call, and they would take her away for about two or three months, and they would put an implant in her spine, Thorazine, I think it was, and that would calm her down. Then she would come back. She'd be like a zombie for about a month, and then she'd be the old Marsha. I mean, back to Neptune and her father. My first down the by mental breakdown started in 1970, and that was then it started falling downhill, and it's been falling up and down ever since. Honey, I walked right down in Walpole's office and walked in. He took some photos, and then he made it. Our group was so screened, and it's called Ladies and Gentlemen, and he had me as a blonde with ponytail called Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. Well, Andy Warhol was the arbiter of what was fabulous, let's face it. When he walked into a room, you knew it was a room worth being in, and he would handpick, by his visual sense, who was worth capturing, whether it painted or a Polaroid. 
for him to do a Polaroid of Marsha makes her legendary. It means she caught the eye of Andy Warhol. She was worth capturing. She was like this transgender version of a Campbell's soup can. I was no one, nobody from Nowheresville until I became a drag queen. That's what made me in New York. That's what made me in New Jersey. That's what made me in the world. We went on Christopher Street. They had a silk screen of Marsha. And they threw us out of the store. They called to Riff Raff. Really? She got, she, we went to look at her silk screen. She was so proud of it. We got thrown out of the store. When I became a drag queen, I started to live my life as a woman. Marsha's success in life wasn't something that suddenly happened because Andy Warhol did a portrait of her. Andy Warhol did a portrait of her after she literally had become a larger than life legend by having converted so many people into fans and friends to going out. She'd always say little things to people like, have a nice day. She seemed to me, I thought, well, you know, to the, but it's funny, those things must matter because she had a special way of making a little extra effort to be extra polite, nice to people. And that really made people love Marsha. The people get lost in the telling of the story. They want the bigger picture what's going to be there, that there was a riot and this is what happened that there were drag queens. They don't really get into the individual people who were more than the Stonewall riot. I mean, these were people that were bigger than life that walked the streets here. And Marsha is, is like in the class of saint of gay life. I mean, like if you ever hear of this old Russian tradition that was called uh, Fools for God. Friends and many people who knew Marsha called her Saint Marsha because she was so generous and she was such a good person, a little queen would come up and say, Marsha, that brooch is so beautiful. And Marsha would say, oh, you like it? Take it right off and give it to her. She was simple, pure. She had her bad days and she'd let you know it. She had so many breakdowns and the gay community recognized she was a saint. That's never been done in their lifetime. It's so practical, too, you know. Marsha was totally mad, but one of the most greatest genius, geniuses on the face of the earth. She was outrageous in a different manner, and she was noticed first for that. But uh, talks then started about her activism. It made her very different. It made people think twice about her and made people want to stop to talk to her and made people listen. I've been in gay liberation ever since the first time I seen I was one of the first drag queens to try and help the drag queens and other people have food at the Alternate U. Alternate U was one of the places that we first tried to help college queens open their doors to gay liberation. When I started getting in newspapers, on TV set for gay pride parade, I was one of the queens to help feed the queens. Yeah, well, hungry. And I started Star House, but I didn't actually start the Star House. Sylvia Rivera started the Star House. And I was just one of the queens that was behind her, like the vice president of Star. I know Marsha was very into political activity in the West Village in the 60s and the 70s. And the group of, I guess, they were all transvestites called themselves Star, S-T-A-R, Street Transvestite Activist Revolutionary which made a lot of sense. I thought it was kind of hilarious because they were all stars anyway. Sylvia Lee Rivera deserves all the credit to star who changed best at that revolutionary because she was one of the people that was in the riot that got arrested a lot for gay rights. One big thing in Marsha's life and also in Sylvia's life was that they had formed a group called STAR, Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries. And they had managed to get some small time mobster who ran a porno store to give them uh, an apartment or something in the Lower East Side in this slum building, which for a few months they operated as a shelter for homeless transgender youth. And they felt that that was one of their great accomplishments in life. And actually, that has ended up going into the history book because it was really the first time anyone had ever tried to make an outreach to the homeless transgender community, especially youth that are kicked out of their home for being transgender. She was talking about nobody's representing her and her rights. But it's basically like part one, two, 
Marsha P. Johnson. Um, shout out to Frameline for this interview. Um, definitely go and watch the rest of their video. Rest in peace to Marsha P. Johnson. She paved the way for a lot of us to even have a platform to talk about this. So I never take this lightly, but I appreciate ones like Marsha P. to keep it going for someone like me because I know when I was reading about she was having a lot of breakdowns and things like that, it's a lot that comes with being an activist and a leadership you know, and just speaking out to have equal rights is draining at times. Uh, but she fought to the very end. I compared her situation a little bit to next in the sense of what's going on in the media right now and the news is that they're putting out this narrative that next died by suicide. They did the same thing with Marsha P. Johnson. They said she died by suicide when it was really the result of transphobia the result of hate with next they're saying oh he wanted to do this he took this medicine and did the most it's like no he was trying to get over a headache a pain that was caused by a fight and there's a whole bunch of people throwing their two cents in there and it's it never makes any sense when you're throwing in hate. People are like, oh, they shouldn't have done this. They shouldn't have done that. But no one's putting the fault at the kids that the ones who put harm toward not only Next, but Next's friends wet. This is part one, y'all. Hope y'all enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments. If you have an interview you think I should check out, let me know. Um, if you heard of Marsha P. Johnson, give me your take. Keep it positive. Keep love in the comments.